No, I'm okay. All right, good. You're giving me the thumbs up. It's because I have no monitor, so I don't know what I sound like out there, but it just sounds loud. I, I hear feedback, but it's just probably me. Okay, so why would God do that? Why would he commit himself to the task of helping the lonely? Why? Well, we understand in Genesis 2.8, you may know this, because this is a verse that we read a lot in marriage. And when I'm getting, getting ready to marry a couple, I usually use this verse. What does it say? Then the Lord God planted a garden of union in the east, and there he placed a man, and he made man. But when you continue to read the rest of the second part of verse 8, it's not up there, and I don't have it for you right now. What, what, what did God say? What did he say? He says, it is not good for man to what? To be alone. You've heard that scripture over and over and over again. And so when we say that verse, we think, oh, he's talking about marriage. But when you really begin to study the, the book of Genesis and what happened to Adam next, he didn't give him a wife right away. What did he give him next? Anybody? Animals. You remember that? He gave him, he gave him that uh, ability to do that. And, and, and I'll get to that part as well. But I want you to understand one thing about loneliness. Loneliness is not an attitude. Loneliness is not an attitude. Somebody that just walks around and they are isolated or they are to themselves or they just want to know. No, loneliness is a spirit. It is a spirit that you don't have to have no friends to be lonely. Anybody? In fact, you can be the most popular person in school youth and be lonely. You can be married to a great gal or great guy and be lonely. You can have great family and at times be lonely. And so there's something to be said there because if you are a Christian, even if you're not, you will come into a point in your life where you may feel lonely. In fact, lonely doesn't mean that you're being punished for your sins. It doesn't mean that you have no faith. Uh, it, it, it's not a religious thing. It's not necessarily that God is testing you or trying you, but it's because you've experienced something, maybe in your past, maybe you're going through something in the present, and it's causing you to feel lonely. Sometimes when you have so many people around you and you're going through something, but they don't understand what you're going through, you feel lonely. And so you're striving to make that connection with somebody that can understand your feeling. And then I can go on from there and it becomes a domino effect. Loneliness leads into depression and depression leads into stress and anxiety. And it's been all the other stuff that we preached about. It's been all that we preached about. And you said, okay, Pastor, but that's great and dandy, but, you know, really, who, did, did, did people in the Bible suffer loneliness? You would be amazed at the people who were men of God, who were faithful, who were anointed, who were obedient, who were kings, who were rulers, prophets that suffered this spirit. In fact, just to name a few, Jacob, Moses, uh, Job, Nehemiah, Elijah, and Jeremiah, you said, yeah, but, but, but show me with scripture. Well, let me go to you with David. Let's talk with David for the one that helped write Psalms, the largest book in the Bible. Look what he says in Psalm 25, 16. Uh, it, it's very clear. Turn to me and have mercy for I am alone and in deep distress. This is David, a man after God's own heart. Yes or no? This is a man who, yes, we know he had his slip-ups, but man, he was a great king. He took down Goliath. In many stories, and I can give you all these things for him to be able to pep himself up, but what? He finds himself in distress. He is lonely, and the Bible says it very clearly in another version that says, Lord, don't turn your back. I'm calling on you. I need you. Have you ever felt like that at work where you're going through something so bad you can't tell your wife, you can't tell your husband because they don't understand, you can't tell your boss or your friend that they'll make fun of you, you can't tell this person or that person because they'll lead you astray and you're like, well shoot, who do I talk to? Loneliness. We all experience, that's David, how about Paul? Paul who was Saul, the Christian, uh, the Christian killer, but then became one of the most powerful men of God, 2 Timothy 4, 9 and 11, watch what it says here. It says, Timothy, please come, he says, as soon as you can. He's telling Timothy, please come as soon as you can, verse 10. It says, D D uh, Demas has deserted me because he loves the thing of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. And it says, Christians, if you keep reading, it says, has gone to Galatia. Titus has gone to Dalmatia. And then verse 11, only Luke is with me. 
bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. This is Paul talking, and he's saying, this person went here, he felt abandoned, and this person went with his mom, and this one went to college, and this one went astray, and, and now I only got Luke with me. And he's got somebody with him, and then he's even got, it says that he's got, he's got Luke with him, and he says, and if, while you're at it, bring Mark. Is it for two or more? I mean, shouldn't Paul have known this? So what does that teach us, church? That we're going to find ourselves in a lonely spot sometimes. In fact, I'll go deeper out to say, in our position in ministry, ministry is a very, very lonely place. Ministry is a very lonely place. You want to know how many people I can talk to? Who can understand what I'm dealing with? How many people I can actually go to them and say, hey, say, hey man, I need to talk to you. But they, they won't look at me as Pastor Pepper, but they look at me as human Pepper. You want to know how many people I have to? I don't have many. Uh, if I have one or two, but I wish I could pour my spirit out to my heart to say, man, can I tell you something and you're not going to judge me or see me different on the pulpit? Okay. Loneliness. It affects us all. You say, yeah, but Jesus is king and he never suffered. Oh, really? Even Jesus, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, suffered loneliness. Prove it to me, pastor. I will. Matthew 27, 46. He's at his most desperate point in his life. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and Jesus caught off with a loud voice. Eli, Eli. Lama Sabatini, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Jesus, the one we seek refuge in, found himself in a lonely time. So before you get religious on me and say, Pastor, that's not me, be careful of that spirit. Because that's a spirit of pride, and that might be even worse than the spirit of loneliness. And their phrase is, everyone is born a winner. And when I saw this phrase, I said, wow. The phrase was, you are not born a winner. You are not born a loser. You are born a chooser. Thought, That's the right phrase. We get to choose today with our circumstance what's getting ready to happen next. God does it. I'm going to say it again. God does it. You choose. He gave you the ability. He gave you his word. His son has already redeemed you. You have the choice today to wake up and who will you serve today? You have the choice to say, will I cry in my mess? Will I be uh, just drowning in my misery and be lonely and choose to be depressed? What will I do? You're not born a winner, church, and you're not born a loser. You're a born a chooser. Turn to your neighbor and say, choose wisely. It reminds me of the story of Paul. Paul, the man with great purpose, we discussed that he was lonely at the time, but God had given him purpose and he said, Paul, you are to go to this land, you're going to go to this island, and you're going to do what you need to do, and you're going to spread the word, and it's not done, you're not going to be finished, you're not going to be, you, you need to do what I called you to do. Now stay with me, church. Because sometimes... Life will throw us a curveball, a distraction, a problem that causes us to be lonely and we focus on the lonely rather than on the purpose before that. Because, you better get this, I just named you three or four people that were the most powerful in the Bible and they suffered from loneliness. Why? Because what the devil likes to do is steal, kill, and destroy. He understands that his or your purpose is greater than his plan. That means Satan's plan. It is greater than that. So he's going to throw everything at you to get you distracted, to get you to feel depressed, to get you to feel lonely. Why? Because when we're lonely, we tend to just shrivel up and die. We tend to just like, oh, all right, well, maybe, you know, maybe it wasn't going to happen. Maybe it was too good to be true. Doubt seeps in, and when doubt comes in, we begin to water with our friends. Yeah, you're right. You just need to stop and quit. But if God promised you something today, he promised you your spouse next to you. He promised you a new job. He promised you a new house. He promised you this and that, and it's still not coming. It's not time to be lonely. It's time to rise and shine and figure out what the heck is going on. And we have Paul 
a man, like I said, with purpose, God says, you are to go to this island and you're going to preach and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. Well, guess what happens? He gets busted and he goes to jail. He goes to jail and the Bible says that he's headed to Crete and he is in this boat. He is in this boat and he is a prisoner on the boat. But God, you better understand what I'm saying right now because I'm preaching to somebody here today. He is in prison, but he is not lonely. He is in prison, but he is not lonely because he knows who is with him. He understands that his purpose is greater than his pain. Church, get this through your head. Because as long as you figure out what your purpose is, no devil in hell can get in your way. I'm talking to somebody else. Oh, pastor, but, but why did this obstacle or why did this hindrance, that's when you should lift up your hands even more and greater because you're getting closer to where God needs you to get. And the devil is lashing and he's throwing and he's trying to put all these obstacles so you don't get to the finish line. But Paul is wrapped up and he's telling the guard exactly what's getting ready to happen. He says, I may be tied up, but my spirit is free. I'm trying to tell you that a storm is coming. He says, the storm is coming, and if we're not careful, guys, something's getting ready to go down. They loose him. And they say, okay, so now the guards respect the prisoner. <laughs> you're not hearing what I'm saying, church. You're not hearing what I'm saying. When your anointing is greater than your pain, people will respect your anointing, even in the midst of your trouble. I'm telling you, you cannot deny someone's anointing. You can't deny it. And Paul says, guys, I'm telling you right now, if you didn't listen to me, we would have gone to South Padre Island and we would have been all right. But you guys were stubborn. <clears throat> you decided to go this route. We're going to hit a storm, but we're not going to die. And everybody's like, well, why can you say that? Because I have a purpose. My purpose is not to die in this storm. My purpose is not to die with you fools who think you have me tied up. I'm here because the Lord's allowing it, not because you have all oh God, you know, hear what I'm saying to you. You know, hear what I'm saying. And so the Bible says that the storm comes. You remember the story? The storm comes, and literally they start throwing stuff off the boat to make it less, uh, to make it away less, and so that it stays afloat. Can you imagine Paul and all of this? And he's just thinking to himself, like, really, guys? Really? Really? The ship. Rest. Now they got to swim to shore. They get to shore to a place that does not like Christians. Hey, really, God? I'm telling you, everything is a test. If you've been coming to discipleship, you know this. He gets to that island, and I love what he does. He doesn't say, oh, the water. I think I have chills from the ooh. He didn't start crying up and get into a little circle because the ship wrecked and because probably he swallowed some seawater and he's probably a little bit nauseated and a little bit seasick because I'm not talking about a cruise ship, I'm talking about a canoe. And he's trying to figure out, he, he could have easily lost it and said, Lord, you know, really, where are you? And com complain like a lot of us do. He could have got into a corner and just sucked his thumb and said, well, these are the cards that I'm dealt and well, maybe because of what I've done. You've been redeemed for what you've done, church. Paul sucks it up. He is freezing. And he doesn't think, can anybody help me? Because sometimes to get out of what you've got to get out of, you've got to get out on your own. You've got to praise by yourself. You've got to pray for yourself. You've got to do whatever you've got to do to get out of your situation. Because sometimes your friends won't help you. Sometimes family, like I said, will turn your back on you. And so Paul says, no, 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 no. I understand. I may be a little cold. I may be a little seasick. But still there is purpose. What does he do? The Bible says he begins to grab sticks. He says, we're going to make a fire because I'm cold. And even in the fire, the snake comes out. Really, Lord? Like you'd have thought, you'd be like, man, get away from Paul, lightning's going to strike him. And the Bible says that with the heat of the fire, a snake came, a poisonous snake, and it, hang, it hung onto his hand. 
It bit him, and what he did next is what we need to learn to do. Shake it off. He didn't say, Jesus! Lark Saker, I hope it wasn't a Brazilian python. No. He didn't say, oh my God, I hope my vaccinations are up to date. No. He didn't say, well, maybe God is a liar because now I'm going to die from this poison today. He shook it off. And he says, I refuse to play the victim. Some of us need to stop playing the victim, so shake it off. Get in there. Hey, I don't care what you've been going through. you got to learn to shake it off. I'm not saying you're not going to get bit. You're going to get bit, but you're not going to die. You're going to get wet, but you're not going to die. You're going to cry sometimes, but you're not going to die. That spirit of loneliness, you must learn to cast it out in Jesus' name and say, greater is he that is in me, that is in this storm, rather than in this boat, rather than in this financial situation. I don't need it. You may not be in agreement with me, but all I need is one person to come into agreement with me. He shakes it off. He shakes it off. And what did the people call him? Oh shoot, he must be a god. He must be a god that even the snakes don't kill him. He wasn't no god. He was an anointed believer who understood his purpose. And I will not fall into the spirit of loneliness. I will not fall into the spirit of depression. He wasn't taking no for an answer. And see, that's what happens with this generation nowadays. We quit too soon. Can I go deeper? We quit, we quit too soon. And so what happens is when we strike loneliness, I'm going to talk a little bit about relationships. You want to know, and I don't mean any offense to this, so don't be like, oh, great. Don't get all feeling feelings. If you're getting feeling feelings, you don't want to come to discipleship. You want to know why all these clubs, why all these internet sites of dating have gone to the roof? Why people are looking for relationships on eHarmony.com? I know some of you maybe got hooked up that way. Don't, don't get offended. I'm just preaching a message. Shake it off. It has skyrocketed. You know why? Because people are lonely and they think by finding another person that's going to fix it. Let me tell you one thing clear off the bat before I finish up here. Loneliness is not the absence of another person. It's the absence of the one person. <laughs> if you don't get this, I'm telling you, it's not about how many people are around you. It's who are you within you. I proved to you earlier that you could be around 20 people and feel Lonely. But these dating sites and these clubs, they have literally skyrocketed because I'm looking for someone else to fill the void. And so what do we do? Hate to say it, this is this generation now. Let's hook up. So we hook up. Maybe there's a pregnancy. Maybe there's an abortion. Maybe there's just sex. Hey, it feels good. It took it away for a little bit, but then the side effects and the symptoms and the consequences come. But Jesus, I prayed, Lord, give me somebody. Yes, and he went with anybody. I knew I wasn't going to get any amens right now. And I'm not going to go and shake your hand today because you probably don't want to shake my hand today. But I'm telling you this because I love you. We are lonely. And so we would rather settle for trash than for what God has prepared for us. Somebody said, ouch. Yeah, pika pika. You say, Pastor, that's not biblical. Oh, I'm going to show you biblical right now. Let me take you to the first eHarmony.com. Adam. Let's, let's just study that in the next three minutes. What does God say? He says, Adam, yes, Lord. I see that you've been alone here for a while. How are you feeling? Well, Lord, I'm not feeling really good right about now. And you haven't invented the German shepherd, so what are you going to do? 
God says, I'm going to give you the authority to name every animal. All right? He had a petting zoo. He had more animals than you could ever imagine. Beautiful creatures. Not just have them, but have authority over them. Stay with me. Some of us find it in people. We try to find that void in people. Some of us find it in pets. But I'll just go with this dog because he's faithful. He's still a dog. We'll get it later. And so, through all that, he's named the parrots and the birds, and he's got the hawks and the cardinals. You'll get that one on Sunday. And he starts going through each one, and he still finds Adam lonely. And he says, Adam, yes, Lord, what's going on? Are you still lonely? You don't think God knew the answer to that? He says, all right, I'm going to put you into a deep sleep. Stay with me because this is a revelation that you must get. He doesn't form a woman from dust. He forms it from... Stay with me, church. So when Eve comes up, they consummate, they get married. That's the first wedding. They do their thing. They have a great relationship. Of course, we know what happened with sin. But the point that I'm trying to make is, till this day, people say, is, well, that is a solution. Marriage. No. Wait, 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 Pastor, he threw me for a loop. You just said that God created Eve for Adam. Yes, but he created it for him. A lot of us are jumping the gun with anybody that wears panties or has underwear. Oh, I got real quiet, real quick in here. Pastor, this is supposed to be our hour of power, not our hour of smashing. I'm trying to help you, church. Because I'm trying to help you understand that the only one that can fill that void, his name is Jesus Christ. And he may have that one person for you, the right friend, the right people, the right spouse, but you've got to be willing to wait and do what you need to do. You can't just take every bit of cheese from every trap that you see. Just to get a quick high, just to get a quick uh, feel, just to get that feeling of, oh, it just feels so good. Oh, I know, sin is great. We know the story of that. Let me give you what happened. The point of what I'm trying to make is before then that God has planned personal relationships for us, friends' relationship with us, family relationship. He's got that all. He's got it. It's not that we're supposed to get along with everybody. You don't need a thousand friends, church. You don't. You just need a two or three good ones that will be in it and got your back. Those that will correct you. I love the phrase that I saw the other day. It says those, the good, good, good friends, the difference between a friend and a great friend is that a friend will not talk bad to you in front of you, but will talk bad behind your back. But a great friend will tell you what's up in your face, but talk good things about you behind your back. That's the difference. We need more of those. We need more of those. And so he's making his helper for Adam, and the reason why they worked out so good is for that simple reason. God said, son, I created one for you. This one's yours. And I can tell you right now that all of us here have someone. Maybe you're married to them already. Maybe you're looking. Maybe you're in a relationship. Maybe, I mean, I hear, I hear this all the time. Pastor, how do I know if he or she is for me? Is it when my hands sweat? Pastor, because I met this girl and she has gray hair. <laughs> Be careful not to fall in lust, but to fall in love. Because everything in about 20 years is going to sag, hang, and look, it's gone. You got it. Oh, Pastor, why are you going to be like that? That's why God invented plastic surgery. Well, go into that another sermon another day. Point and conclusion. Eve 
was especially created for him so that he would not be lonely. There are people, let me tell you this one thing real clearly. If you say God is your father, if you're here today you say God is my father, and just as me as a father, am very careful of what relationships my son has, stay with me, and I will go to him and say, son, watch out with that boy. He's going to mess you up, son. Ah, yeah, you, I'm telling you, son, you better watch your back. Or a little girl comes in and trying to get into his pants. Honey, dad, dad, she's a Christian, so be careful. She believes in God, so does Satan. <laughs> be careful. If I have to, if, if I have to continue to correct him, to guide him, and I'm an earthly father that I would do evil, him who is heavenly, why don't we trust him with the people he places in front of us? Oh, because they may not look like what you think. Oh, man, I, I, I'm just going to say this because i got to sit here and i got to go home. I'm going to run out of the back. I'm tired of hearing this phrase, lady, so please don't tell me this phrase. Pastor, I'm just looking for a good man. I'm going to steal one for my friend. Don't look for a good man. Look for a godly man. Big difference. Big difference. And if you think, I'm still looking. Ask yourself, are you a good woman? That God may I send you a good man that you may ruin him. Oh, hell yeah, I went there. Be very careful. Be very careful. Don't you be asking for great delicious fruit when you are poison ivy. Don't do it. Don't do it. But the moment... You decide to humble yourself and say, Lord, make me a better person. God is already working on your part. You don't have to be going through all these search engines and Google. And the first one that pops up, that's confirmation from the Lord. No, 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 no. No, no, it's not going to work that way. I'm telling you, when me and my wife got married, it wasn't just because of No. In fact, you know our story. I couldn't stand her. She couldn't stand me. But when we got to know each other, then I asked the Lord for three signs in fasting, and I got all three signs. I said, that person not done. Now, does that mean that her and I don't go through stuff? We go through stuff all the time. There's times where I'm sure she has found herself lonely. There's times when I have found myself lonely because she doesn't understand me. But that is still my partner. Created for me. God can give it to you. But it's your responsibility to take care of what God gives you. Stand to your feet now. Some of you are single. And you keep throwing that net. You keep throwing that around. Let's just see whatever happens. Let's see. Maybe, maybe it'll be trout this week. Because last week was catfish. And I don't like catfish. You know what I'm talking about. Ooh, I got a big one. Be careful. Be careful because everybody comes up nowadays with baggage. And it's not until you clean the fish that it really takes it anyway. If this message touched your life, you're dealing with the spirit of loneliness, you're feeling with the spirit of the depression, we're, we're wrapping up this series. You just say, look, I just want direction. I want to be jumping into these things of that. I want the right friends. I want to be the right husband. I want to be the right wife. I, I don't want to feel the spirit of this is for you. Come on up here quickly. We got one minute. This is all to serve. It's not to, it's not to embarrass anybody. It's not to say, oh, look at you. No, it's not like that. Help comes to those who ask for it. And like I said, if Jesus felt lonely at one time, who are you not to feel lonely? You're going to feel lonely. It's going to happen. It's happened to all of us. But you don't have to stay lonely. You don't have to stay lonely. God can help you. He will help you if you allow it. All we got to do is call upon his name. Lord, I need your help. I need your help, Lord. I need your help. Would you throw your arms up and just say, Lord, I need your help. I need you. I've made some dumb decisions. i made some stupid choices. I'm sorry, Lord. I keep doing it. I keep falling in the same problem in the same rut. I'm tired of it, Lord. 
don't want to do this anymore. I want to be happy. I, want to, I don't want to be fit in this misery. I don't want to be filled this void. Only God can fill that void, church. Not another person. Not another relationship. Not another like on Facebook or a follower on Twitter. No, no. Just worship in the minute, would you? Just say, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for my ignorance. I'm sorry for my stubbornness. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. Father, we just call upon you today. We just call upon you today.
all those covenant partners that continue to bless this ministry financially, you know who they are. You know them by hand, Lord. I don't need to know their names, Father. They're not giving to me. They give to you. And we just thank them. Thank you for them and continue to bless their businesses, their lives, their homes with prosperity. And we just thank you for your people today, Lord, as we continue to learn your word. In Jesus' mighty name, let us never forget, Father God, that you are with us. Even though our mother and father may forsake us, you will never leave us nor forsake us. You are with us. In Jesus' name, if somebody believes it, would you shout, Amen. Give the Lord a big, great God.